My intention this evening is actually to try to explain to you what type of ethical code we actually do have and how we deliver it in practice. Because if that's what the public perception of lawyers is, that effectively we're out as high guns, then I'd like to have the opportunity to show you that there is a lot of thought, practice, principles and disciplinary code behind that ethos. And also to give you an understanding about how we approach uh, the work we do, whether it's a criminal barrister or a family barrister. So that's my aim. Can I say the lecture has got two parts? This part is where I'm talking to you face to face or over the internet. Hello, everyone. And it's designed to be the type of lecture which guides you through the basic principles. But you're going to get two lectures for the price of one because the handout that you'll get afterwards goes into a lot more detail about the technicalities behind things such as litigation privilege, legal professional privilege, and protection against self-incrimination. So if I burden this lecture too much with that detail, we won't go through the big themes, which is why, as I say, it's a two-part lecture. Please pick up the handout when you can as you leave. So now, my first challenge, other than persuading you we do have ethics, is to work out this. Aha, right. So the topic that I will be talking to you about. When you see those words, what should leap out to you is the two core principles, ethics and morals and honour. Truth, integrity, integrity and respect. And everything I talk to you about now, they are the principles which should guide every budding barrister, every aspiring practicing barrister, and frankly, every senior barrister before they become too jaded and should frankly be doing something else in their working lives. What I am also going to talk to you about is specifically how ethics fits into the role of being a barrister. And I do that because I need to say plainly and frankly right at the beginning that this is not a talk about what solicitors can and do. And just in case people don't understand the basic difference between them, because you might all have been watching too much American law, let me just say the roles of a solicitor and a barrister are very, very different and equally important. A solicitor is effectively the first point of contact for the client. Their responsibility is to manage the case litigation, to gather the evidence that the client says is out there to support the case, and to deal with the correspondence and communications between the client and the other parties and the court. Think of it more like a GP role. Your client will go to the solicitor and in effect they'll be able to deal with the majority of cases and clients that walk through their door. But just like a GP, if they come across a problem which is too complex for them to deal with, either because of matters of law or because it requires particular skills in the courtroom or drafting schools, then they come to us, a barrister, because that's the area in which we excel. And our responsibility is to take charge of the pleadings, and by that I don't mean everyone's praying before they go into court, I mean the written document that sets out the case. We're responsible for arguing that case on law and fact in court, and we're the specialists in advocacy who try to persuade the judge that our case is the one that should be found proven at the end of the trial. So that's to give you an idea where the differences are, and I'm speaking very much about what I know, which is ethics in the role that I undertake, which is to be a barrister. So that's what we aspire to be. Let me tell you what we are not. Right. These are examples of some of the displays of barristers you would have seen in recent uh, TV life. One thing, we're not superheroes. Obviously, our egos are such we might like to think we are, but in the main, we're not. We aren't like Judge John Deed, going out, gathering the evidence, you know, making sure there are no obstacles to the path of justice by going out and grabbing that villain, pushing him up against the side of the door and saying, go on, admit it, will you? Nor are we, um, as in Broadchurch, I think 2015, the type of barrister which goes out and does almost the same thing but slightly more elegance and then effectively becomes a private investigator as well as the advocate. We are none of those things. We are exactly as I've described. We are the link between the court, the client and the case and our skills are advocacy and legal argument and legal analysis. Because those roles are so significant, we start training in ethics very, very young. As young as this, possibly not, but we get there. Effectively, the principles of ethics and how they interplay with your practice start before you've even got near a qualifying certificate. It happens when you're at bar school, it happens when you're at your training stage, and it happens when you're at your vocational stage. I won't break down each of those zones in detail. Again, you'll have the written notes. But it's really up there to illustrate that there's no point in your training to become a barrister where the significance of ethics in practice is not taken on board by your professional training body. We need to get the message across to you young because, quite frankly, if you get as far as practicing, 
it won't be long before you're hit with a problem which strikes you like a juggernaut and you don't know what to do with it. That doesn't make you stupid. It doesn't make you unique. It's just a reminder that the uniqueness of the cases that you deal with are as unique as the clients and the facts, and no amount of training can actually give you the right answer. All we can do is, one, show you who to go to when you're in doubt, and two, instill in you the principles, the basic principles of ethics, which you can then apply to the problem you have in question. When you qualify as a barrister, that doesn't mean to say you can tick that button, no need to go back there, because you have to carry on having qualifying sessions, and that will carry on and will carry on as you are in your profession. So it's not a subject where you ever think you know anything. And if there's one thing I can't emphasise enough during the course of this lecture, it's that however much I talk about this subject, I simply cannot tell you and explore to you in, uh, with the way I'd want to the sheer complexity of the ethical dilemmas that I've had to deal with, in particular in the last five years. And I'm now getting long in the tooth. And I would have thought I would have known the, inst the answer instantly. I haven't. I've struggled with issues that have been confronted with me in the course of the cases I have done. So um, that's the barrister's training. And let me just move on to reassure you that going through this process is not one in which you'll be walking the path alone. Because it is so serious, because you are going to be in charge of someone's case which may challenge the outcome of their lives, you cannot expect to go into that work without having people to turn to. And this is an example about who is there to help. As a barrister, you'll have to join an inn, and the inns all run the courses that I've just indicated. They are there not simply to give you training, it will be effectively a resource you can go back to for further assistance when you heat something that you can't deal with in your working life, and there's no one else that you can turn to because you might not have a tendency yet, for example. We have organisations, specialist organisations such as the FLBA, of which I'm a member, that's the Family Law Barristers Association. Equally, if you're a criminal barrister, you'll have your criminal bar association. They are just there as two examples. Every form of law that you choose to practice in will have a professional body designed and dedicated to be there to support you. You'll have the chambers that you join, whether as a pupil or as a tenant. The expectation of that chambers is that you will conduct yourself professionally and ethically, and they are there and should be there in order to guide you when you have a problem, either with your roommate, a senior colleague, or the head of chambers. They expect to have calls. They're delighted to have calls. I have one this morning. We will always make time to speak to you. And then friends. We have friends. It's the way we learn, frankly, in our profession, because to take it back to our family is sometimes too much. They don't understand what we're going through. You'd have to explain so many rules before you get to the problem, you'd exhaust them. They'd go to bed and you'd still be there crying over your cup of tea or glass of wine, whichever is your particular tipple. So friends going through the same process is where you will inevitably talk through some of the problems you have, and that is a resource you must nurture throughout the whole of your professional life. And then there's a telephone there, because the resource which very few people know about until they are at the point of desperation is the Bar Standards Board. They have set up an ethical resource service, which effectively is there as phone a friend. They have silks, QCs, and junior barristers, senior junior barristers, who man the phones, who are willing to take your ethical queries and to deal with them. And they do that with a really um, supportive staff that keeps the whole administration program going. And the intensity is such, as I think one of the later show, uh, slides reveals, is that they receive over 500 calls per month. Now, that's a figure just to illustrate to you that there is nothing wrong in confronting a problem in terms of ethics and practice and thinking, I can't handle it. That's when you pick up the phone. That's when you speak to people more senior themselves. And whilst they can't give you the answer, Effectively, they're giving you a sounding board and they guide you through the codes and your core duties, which takes me on to the next two slides, and these are the killers, okay? I'll come back to them later on in the lecture because I'm conscious that by giving you the 10 core duties, I'll go through them at a pace where you don't think you've absorbed them. So don't hesitate. Simply take in the overview, and I'll come back to them as they become relevant as I continue talking. So the 10 core duties... Number one, you must observe your duty to the court in the administration of justice. Number two, you must act in the best interests of each client. Three, you must act with honesty and integrity. 
Four, you must maintain your independence. Five, you must not behave in a way which is likely to diminish the trust and confidence which the public places you or your profession in. Number one is in bold, because that, if there is a clash between any of the core duties, is the guiding principle. When in doubt, your duty to the court trumps everything, and that's what must govern you as you come within our profession and progress within it. Number two, you've got to act in the best interest of the client. As I'll come on to explain, you are there to do a job for the person that's instructed you. You are not there to make friends. You're not there to make a friend of the judge or opponents. You are there to act for the client whose case may be one that it's difficult to articulate, but which he or she has a right to be articulated on their behalf. You must act with honesty and integrity, and I'll come on to some details of that in a moment, but essentially you are there in this role, and you are in a position of trust and responsibility, because if someone chooses to bring you the sad deritus of their life and ask you to go into court to see what you can do to try to put the pieces together to make a puzzle that enables them to live after they live court, leave court with some dignity and some semblance, of um, having come out satisfied that the justice system has worked from you, then they must trust you. Trust and lawyers aren't the two words you often see in the press. But if we can't make you, our clients, trust, if not in us as individuals, but in our capacity and competence to do the job, then you should not be instructing us. Because the work we do on your case carries long, for a long time outside of the conference room and the courtroom. And if you do not think we're doing that work to the best of our, your ability, if you do not think that we are listening to what you are saying, if you do not think we are challenging you for your best interests, then you don't have confidence in us and you don't have trust and you should not be using us. We must maintain our independence and we must behave in a way which is, uh, shouldn't diminish the public profession. If we behave um, as a President of the United States in such a way that brings that office into disrepute, then we bring down all of those who aspire to that office. We cannot do that as practicing barristers. We have to behave ethically, and that's for reason for if we ha have any convictions, we cannot practice. So we have to have a, a record that can inspire the public to make us believe that we're entitled to carry out the job we do. So that's one to five. Six to uh, ten, you've got to keep the affairs of your client confidential. You must provide a competent standard of work and service. You must not discriminate unlawfully. You must be open and cooperative with your regulators. So we are being looked at as much as you are looking us to see if we can do our job properly. You must take reasonable steps to manage your practice and carry out your role within your practice competency and in such a way as to achieve compliance with your legal and regulatory obligations. On the one hand, that means we have to pay our taxes. So if we've got trouble with inland revenue, we may have trouble practicing because those two things do not sit side by side very well. Equally, if we are, if we are convicted of an offence, that will seriously impact on whether we have the ability to carry out our function as a barrister. And equally, we have to carry on training ourselves. It's not as simply a case of getting through bar school, going through your pupillage, and then saying bye-bye to education. We have an obligation to make sure we keep ourselves abreast with developments, and that will be measured and assessed by our regulators. So I've told you a little bit about how, when the crisis comes, you can seek help, and this takes you back as a reminder to the Bar Council and the services that it offers. But it makes clear in the guidance it gives that whilst those to who answer the telephone call will do their best to point you to the regulations, ultimately, the buck rests with you. They take no responsibility for the decision you make. They don't know the facts of the case as you do, and they can only receive the information you choose to give them. So quite rightly, when it comes to a decision to be made, you're on your own. And in life the lessons and the clashes between ethics and practice are very, very hard indeed. So what I'm going to do is now just lighten the mood a little, because it's come down slightly, and I'm just going to talk you through a fictional dinner party with the type of questions that you will inevitably be asked or want to ask. So let's go for this one. You're a lawyer. How low will you go? Remember what I said about trust and confidence? Well, here we go. I'm starting off at the lowest ebb. The first thing is that we are not like this, all right? We may wear black suits, we may look very foxy, we may be very stylish, we can cause serious damage legit legitimately through the words we use in court, but we are not high guns. 
So why do I say that? Okay, first principles, no coaching or nobbling. That's not the language of the code. Obviously, we talk about much more elegant ways of saying it, but basically it's no coaching and no nobbling. And what does that mean? It means you mustn't encourage a witness to give evidence which is misleading or untruthful. It means you mustn't rehearse or coach a witness in preparation for their evidence. Again, nothing like you've seen on TV. Um, you mustn't communicate with any witness, including your client, about the case in which the witness is giving evidence. Now, let me just break that down for you. You must not encourage a witness to give evidence which is misleading or untruthful. That encompasses the case where you get a statement from a client or your client comes to you, and there's a mixed bag of points there. Some of them you think, I love that point. I really want that point. I'm so going to win on that point. I'm going to feel marvellous with that point. And then you turn the page over and you think, Okay, that's, that's going to undermine that brilliant point I saw on page one. What you can't do is extract page two from your brief and pretend it wasn't there. Equally, you can't tell your client, oh, that's a really bad point. You know what? It's a shame it's a matter of fact that you're telling me rather than opinion. Because if it was opinion, I could talk to you about it. But if that's the facts, then... I'll deal with the cases they are. So you can't massage the evidence, even though it may ultimately assist your client's case. You mustn't rehearse the witness. And that's because the judge is there to evaluate the evidence. You're not there to massage it in the, in the oral form just as much as you should massage it in the written form. You mustn't communicate with the witness while they're actually in the witness box. To do that is one of the greatest contempts of court possible. So you can't give them cues about how well are you doing. Oh, that was a really dodgy answer. If I were you, I'd go back and try it in this way. That is not permitted. Once your client is in the witness box, they are in perda. You do not speak to them. No one else speaks to them. They can speak to them. I clarify about things like where the toilet is and where to go and get some food or who won the latest game in football of the particular uh, player they fancy. You can't talk to them about the case. If they try to talk to you about it, you tell them no. If they persist, you walk away. The only exception to that is if you need to talk to them during the course of their evidence about something that can't wait, for example, arrangements about the child being picked up in a family case or a piece of evidence that's emerged which requires an answer. And you can only do that when you have clearance from your opponents and the judge to do so. That's how important it is for the judge to know that once the witness is in the box, it's their evidence they're hearing, not something tailored. Okay, so no coaching or nobbling. Next point, you can't uh, make the evidence up and you can't over-egg the cake. Now, this is really important. It comes down to the basis upon which we trust the cases to be presented to the court. So you can't draft a statement of fact or a pleading unless you have the facts that establish the reliability of what you are actually arguing. So you might have a case, for example, where... You know, looking at checkerboard responses, you've got 10 points out of 12, which you think is going to mean your case is going to come home. You can't, with wishful thinking, add in the extra two because that's going to get you over the, over the, the uh, final line. You can only plead that which you have the material to um, evidence and which you will pursue. Equally, you should only plead a contention that is properly arguable. So don't waste the court's time with arguments that absolutely are, that are bad law and on known bad law. Allegations of fraud are viewed with such seriousness that there you actually have evidence to back up the claim. And in terms of a witness statement, you again can't gild the lily. You can't put something in with creative drafting that actually you don't think your client may come up with, but you're pushing it a bit because if you settle before the trial, no one will know. And that's because when we receive pleadings in our cases, we are entitled to know if a barrister has settled them that they are arguing the case based on the material that they have. Because if all of us tried making it up, frankly, there'd be no point having any type of pleadings at all. You may as well go into the court, put your witness into the box and see what came out. That's how important it is to have integrity, independence and honesty. And if you are asked to do anything outside of those rules, then you do not do it. What else? Uh, this comes back to, I won't say it's John, Judge John Deed, because I think he never actually corrupted the evidence by offering money, but, you know. Um, you can't effectively bribe a witness to give favourable evidence to you. Uh, and that's obviously so basic that it shouldn't need saying, but I will, because it's part of the small board of your starter. So let's go on to dinner party question number two. 
How can you defend someone you know is guilty? Now, to all of you barristers out there that have had this question asked of you as though it's the most creative question in the whole wide world, and despite the fact that you've heard it a hundred times, you have to put on that engaged, interested face and answer. This is, this is the way to do it for those of you that haven't yet become taxed by this particular question. Okay, this is so important, I'm going to spend some time on it. Your duty to the court does not prevent you from putting your client's case simply because you don't believe that the facts are as your client states them to be, okay? Your belief is not relevant. Why is your belief not relevant? It's because the rule of law and the judge's belief or the jury's belief is what counts, not yours. And you do not transgress those boundaries. It's why we have the cab rank rule, okay? This is a really simplified version of the cab rank rule. Essentially, if you receive instructions from a professional client and you are available and it's within your professional competence, then, and it's your, by doing the job, you have the right seniority, you've got the right area of expertise, and you are available, you must accept the instructions addressed specifically to you. Now, the cab rank rule implies to you that that means that a barrister cannot reject the instructions that are accepted through his chambers. And to that extent, the cab rank rule is right. It's what we are there to do. If we are available for hire, and you hire us, we take you to where you want. But unlike the cab rank rule, you, the client, doesn't have to take the first taxi in the queue. It's a really important difference that most members of the public don't understand. The cab rank rule is there so that the client can choose the barrister of their choice. That's vital for two reasons. It means that, one, they don't end up with those barristers that no one else wants, okay? Two, it means that the barrister has to take the case even if they don't like the subject and the content. That's a protection to the barrister as, a, as much as it is to the client because effectively the barrister is entitled to say, my responsibility is my duty, my ethical responsibility is to take this case. You cannot criticise me for so doing because it's the way in which our justice system functions. Otherwise, those with the most heinous cases would never get representation. And that is not right in a system which requires legal representation to balance up those scales of justice I just showed you. So it means that even though you don't like the identity of the client, you don't like the nature of the case, you don't know whether you're being uh, paid privately or it's publicly funded, any belief or opinion which you have formed as to, the, as to your client's likely guilt or innocent is absolutely off the radar in terms of a reason to refuse taking that brief. So what you can't say is that is a heinous crime that has allegedly been committed, note the word allegedly. That is a heinous act of sexual abuse that I'm being asked to defend this alleged paedophile from. I will not do it. And you don't do it because you don't know what happened. You weren't there you're not a witness, you act on your client's instructions, and by so doing, you will be respected by the rest of your profession. That cardinal rule underpins the independence of the bar, and it, provide, it underscores our duty to provide legal representation to all those that require it. It is so significant that it's professional misconduct for you not to comply with that duty. Now, bear in mind, I said this is a talk about what barristers do. Solicitors have different rules that govern, and they have, are entitled to have more selectivity about the cases um, they deal with. So I just want to make it plain. This is a barrister-specific uh, discussion only. What are the exceptions, you say? By looking to the exceptions, you can actually see just how rigid this rule is. So a conflict of interest. Perhaps you've had a conversation with the solicitors that's instructed on the other side, and they've told you something about the case over a drink. That's given you knowledge about the other side's case, which you can't use because clearly it would mean that their case was compromised and you'd have unfairly obtained information. So that's an obvious one. Um, your pre-book for another matter, fair enough. Um, it's outside your experience or above your seniority. Again, absolutely fair enough. You're there to do the job for the client. If you don't have the skills or experience to do so, you must say no and do so honestly. You're not being paid a proper fee. 
but that doesn't apply so far as legal aid is concerned. However low it goes, so far as crime, you'll be expected to do the work. Uh, your fees haven't been agreed, um, and then there's arrangements about um, what other responsibilities you have. It is a really limited list of exceptions. Effectively, that's what we're in it for. A barrister job is not for the faint-hearted because you just don't know what's going to come through your chamber's door in terms of the type of case you're going to have to deal with. Now, the code doesn't simply tell you you have to do it. It goes further, and it says this, how you do it. Well, how you do it isn't lily-livered. It's not weak. It's not apologetically. It's not, oh, I'm so sorry, my instructions are casting a difference between your client and yourself. You go into it with full throttle and passion, all the judgment at your disposal and skills. You have to promote, you have to represent your client fearlessly. That means you represent your client whatever the social media may say, whatever your family say, whatever the judge says, and whatever your opponent says. And that is not easy to do. All of us have been in situations where the judge abhors our client. The judge is disgusted with the points that we are raising on that client's behalf. That's not a reason to back off. If your instructions are to put that case and it's properly arguable, then you put it. You have to do so without regard to your interests or any consequences for you. Remember what I said, the judge who looks at you as though he really wishes you hadn't got out of bed that morning. Well, you're not doing yourself very many favours, are you, in terms of having that nice little rubber stamp of judicial approval on your career progression. But that's your job. Equally, you have to do the job you do without fear of influence by your professional client or any other person, and that includes your solicitor. I have been in cases where I've had to advise my client to sack his instructing solicitor. That doesn't make for a very easy conference. I've had to do it more than once. But you do it even though this client will only see you once for the case of a lifetime and the solicitor may instruct you on a regular basis not just in that year, but over years, because your client duty comes first over and above your professional responsibility or desire to make sure you keep pally with people. That's not the way the system works. Why is that so important? It's really important when you remember the type of trials which we went through in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s, where there were pariahs considered by the public and by some degrees of the judiciary and then see what happens. Birmingham 6, Guildford 4, just a reminder. So one of the highest and most esteemed judges in the land, Lord Denning, said of this when dismissing a claim for damages by um, the Birmingham 6 for injuries they've received in police custody. To accept that the police were lying would be, as you can see, would be an appalling vista. And in so doing, he dismissed their claim. 11 years later, he was wrong, saying the West Midland detectives had let us down. That's an illustration about how, in the face of what was a very global assault upon the honesty of the defence put upon the Guildford Four and the Birmingham Six, how skillful, dedicated lawyers nonetheless went in to fight the fight for them, and how time told the truth of the tale. And again, a reminder about why that's important. I'm the advocate. I'm not the judge. I wasn't there. I don't know what the facts are. So why, therefore, am I possibly in a position to take a view about guilt or innocence of my client? The hypothetical question about how can you act for someone who is guilty, how, in my instance, how can you act for that abuser, has already assumed that the person is an abuser. And that's not right, is it? Because otherwise you wouldn't be having a trial. Any competent barrister goes right back to basics. One, they make no assumptions. Two, they objectively assess the evidence. Three, they apply their forensic skills to identifying the flaws in that evidence based on the instructions they receive from their client. Next, they go into court, they fight the case. And ultimately, it's for the judge to decide, not for you to do so. So what about the overwhelming case? You say, oh, that's all very well, Joe. OK, you may be talking about things that are 50-50, but we've all been in cases where the evidence on paper looks overwhelming. There's CCTV, we've got social media. 
We've got impeccable witness accounts saying that this um, person was abused by that abuse. On paper, we've got United Experts' opinion against us. Yet, you must remember that evidence as it appears on paper is not the same as it appears once tested in cross-examination. And just to show you how significant it is, you cannot go into a trial in a half-hearted fashion because actually you think it's a bit of a loser and you'd much rather get out quickly and protect your professional reputation with your mates and go and have a drink with them because who wants to be, who wants to be thankful for the awkward one that's asking those extra questions and making sure everyone stays in court late? But you have to because there will come a moment in those trials where you ask the question, that shines a beacon of light upon what was otherwise a crack in the prosecution case. And through that chink, you can see a chasm beneath it, which you want to go through and mine and su show sunlight upon. Well, what you can't do is say to the judge, do you know what, can I recall that witness in week one? Because I actually didn't try very hard because I thought it was a bit of a slam dunk. But actually now I see that my client might actually have a case. So can we just rerun again? You can't do that, which is why you go into the case at the beginning, fighting it as it's meant to be fought, because there are no second chances for witnesses and there's no second chance for your clients. That's why you do the job. So, a fabulous quote from The Secret Barrister. If any of you haven't bought a copy of this book yet, you must go and get it. I'm not plugging it shamelessly because I get a commission. I'm plugging it because it is an awesome book. If every MP has been required to read it, then so should you. And what does he say about this? Because I like he or she. I'm already showing my unconscious bias there. So one of you can tell me off about that later. What does he say? Um, I can't mislead the court. So effectively, if the client says they're guilty, you can't go in and positively argue their innocence. But um, if he says, I didn't do X, then my job is to advise him of the strength of the prosecution evidence, the likely outcome of the trial. And if he still says that the 50 witnesses, DNA experts, and crystalline CCTV footage have got it wrong, I put on my wig. I go into battle for him because he may, contrary to how it appears, be innocent. Okay. So... We're still on our dinner party analogy. I'm not going to go onto the pudding course yet, so I'm offering you some more wine. Right. How can you work in a system where there's one law for the rich and another for the poor? That does tend to come out at some point. And I can sit there, you know, bigging myself up because I do legal aid work, so of course that doesn't apply to me. Um, and then, of course, we get examples like this one Mr. Loophole and Mr. Beckham last week. Okay. So, how can Mr. Loophole defend David Beckham when he knows he's guilty? Now, remember, I've just been talking to you about belief being irrelevant, knowledge being all important, and here I'm throwing an example about where knowledge of guilt is in your grasp. Your client's told you it, you've told the court it. What next? Well, the reason you are still able to act in that situation is that the facts of the case applied to the statutes gave a golden defence which Mr. Loophole quite properly advised his client about and which Mr. Loophole quite properly argued in his court and very successfully so. It, you go back to the word in the statute. Remember, you're a lawyer. You look at what the law says you do. And the statute said a person shall not be convicted if they have not received the notice of intended prosecution within 14 days. And on this instance, it wasn't 14 days, it was 15 once you have an absolute rule, it doesn't matter if it's half a day, a day, a year, a month. It's not been done according to rules of statute. Therefore, there is a defence. Therefore, you will take it. Remember what I said. Your responsibility is to your client. So, this is a fantastic barrister's blog, by the way, by Matthew Scott. I recommend you look at it together with some of the others which I've quoted in my previous lectures because he puts it really beautifully. That gives you the background. I've told you that already. I'm just going to go to his quote, which is, there's, no, there's nothing immoral or improper about running a technical defence if that's what the client demands. It's not for the lawyers to pick and choose which laws to apply, and there's a bigger picture here. It's by constantly testing and arguing the limits of individual laws that the rule of law is upheld. Okay? Don't pick and choose. Don't make moral judgments. That's not your role. 
Because, as he says, despite this, there is no shame in a lawyer honestly using the law to protect his client from the consequences of his crimes. So you can't criticise the lawyer for the approach you take. You might think it was a really misjudged move by Mr Beckham. He may no, may no longer quite be the saint that the public thought he was, but that's his responsibility and his choice. So, if I've made things so blindingly simple to you so now, I'm now going to ruffle you off a bit because I'm going to talk to you about the additional responsibilities a family barrister has, okay? Now, I chose that picture for a reason, all right? That's the way you're likely to feel after I've gone through the next few slides, okay? So, next question. What do you do in a family case if you know the clients are guilty because they've told you you are? Remember, I've got that caveat there. They've told you. I'm not interested in belief. I'm interested in knowledge. Remind you, the cab rank rules. Nina, Nina, red, red, red. You must observe your duty to the court in the administration of justice. But you've got to, put, you've got to act in the best interest of your client and you've got to behave ethically with honesty and integrity, and you must protect your client's confidentiality. How on earth do you balance each of those when your client has told you that they have abused a child? Now, if you're a defence barrister, what you can do is properly test the prosecution evidence against you, and as long as you don't assert your client's innocence, you're entitled nonetheless to carry on acting for him, because that's what the responsibility of the barrister is. But what do you do in a family case? Right, it gets tricky, because our role is not only to represent the client, but it's to do so in a way which doesn't distort the administration of justice, and in the work that we do, we have a duty to the court, which ultimately is there to identify and to protect the welfare of a child. We can't conduct a trial or continue to represent our client in it whilst withholding relevant information that might affect the outcome of the case. And in those instances, the duty of confidentiality we owe is overridden by our duty to the court. Now, that's a tough call. Why does that come about? It's because of this case, not per se, but by articulating the principles that guide us, Essentially, what the laws, um, what our approach to family law is, it's a non-adversarial process. It's why we have a number of elements that differentiate our jurisdiction from the criminal jurisdiction. Balance of probabilities, so 50-50, not beyond all reasonable doubt. Our cases can be decided by, are decided by judge, not judge and jury. It's why hearsay is admitted into our case and not in criminal jurisdiction, glossing over the technicalities, but just to give you some broad outlines. And we have to apply that due diligence, that duty to act with honesty and integrity and to be independent in a way which requires us to make very, very hard choices. So if we receive information which is relevant to the welfare of the child, we have to think what use to make of it. An illustration. We can't hold back negative experts' reports. So we can't shop around having received a negative one until we get a positive one. The experts' report we give, we have to disclose. Equally, if our client tells us that off the radar they've gone and approached some expert in America and, moreover, they've sent the confidential children up material, then we have to tell the court and our opponents that that's what they've done and we have to disclose every communication between our clients and that so-called expert, whether they are or not. And we have to do that whether the evidence is positive or negative and even though it may impact on our client's credibility and honesty. It really is complicated. But that's because we can't know knowingly, recklessly, or otherwise attempt to mislead the court. And if there is relevant evidence which you know about which could change the outcome, that is misleading the court by withholding it. So it's hard. In what situation do I say it's hard? Let me give you some examples. So our client uh, make, might make an admission. Our client might make a threat to a family member. They might say, whatever the decision of the court, it's not going to happen because I'm going to be on a plane with the kid. They might say, don't worry, that's not going to happen. That witness isn't coming to come to court. I've had a word with him. They are all relevant issues which you have to immediately put on your Nina Nina hat and think, what do I do now? All right? Now... You can try to avoid the situation by telling your client before they've opened their mouth at all what your duties and responsibilities are. Then move on from there. So this is your guidelines to advice. 
before the case really gets kicking, you tell them that your responsibility is to make disclosure to the court of all relevant material that relates to the child's well-being. You tell them that you can't receive information in confidence that conflicts with their case so that they have a decision about whether they tell you it or not. They tell, you tell them you can't mislead the court. You set out the ground rules to them before they're in a situation where effectively you're pulling the rug from beneath their feet. All right? The other thing you have to tell them, which is a really hard way of distilling complicated language into simple rules, is about the privilege against self-incrimination and its limitations in family cases. What you are staring at in terms of your trial conduct is the knowledge that you have as a lawyer but your client doesn't know that when they get in that witness box, all the films they may have seen where someone takes the fifth, all right, and refuses to answer questions, does not apply in the family court. There is no privilege against self-incrimination in the family court. If you are asked a question which goes to your guilt or culpability, you have to give an answer. You cannot stay silent. That silence amounts to contempt, and the judge can take adverse inferences from it. And the reason the warning about your client about that stage of evidence is significant is that if you receive ad information adverse to your client's case during the course of the trial, and you advise your client that it should be disclosed but they don't, if you carry on acting, even though you've run up the bar ethical service and they're likely to advise that you withdraw, then there will come a point when the proverbial really does hit the fan. Because when your client is in the box and comes out with a pack of lies, which you know to be lies, no, not belief. Remember those two words. You've been told it's not true. Then you can't allow that evidence in court to remain unmarked. You cannot sit there silently, thereby effectively legitimising the lie that your client has told, and you will have to withdraw. And that means the trial folds. That can't be allowed to happen. So you can't ignore the dilemma. You have to confront it, you have to deal with it, and you do it right at the beginning stages. So privilege against self-crimination, complicated subject, lots of details in the handout I'm going to give you. Why do we have that there? Effectively, the family courts um, take away the um, alleged abuser's right not to ask questions because they say, we're a family court, tell us everything that's relevant, and we will control... Um, the use of that information by any external agencies. So you can tell us anything you want. It's, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice little cosy world that we occupy. That is, in reality, an illusionary protection because the judgment that the court makes against you, at the very least, will be going to the prosecutor authorities. They're likely to ask for a transcript of the evidence. So even if, at the moment you say those words in the witness box, the local authority aren't on the line to the police telling them what you've said, and they may well do, at the point when the judge gives a judgment, that information will go down through the hotline from the care proceedings to the criminal court. So it is illusionary to say that what you say in the family court won't filter out into the criminal jurisdiction, particularly now when family courts, in their desire to try to get cases sped up in order to meet the needs of the child and the timescales of the child, quite often hear very serious cases, including allegations of attempted murder or really serious sexual abuse or fatal injuries to a baby before the criminal trial has even got to prosecution stage. So, worry, wait, but then give the advice that hopefully means that you're not placed in a situation where it's simply um, too late to do anything for your client. So, let's take the situation where you've received the information, you've had to withdraw because your client doesn't accept your advice. Is the matter over? Okay, remember I said this is the more wine stage? The answer is no. If you have been told something which amounts to a threat, which could cause harm to a child or a named individual, and that threat of harm isn't remote, and you think the threat is genuine, even though you've been sacked or you've withdrawn, you can't stay silent. You think carefully about the credibility of the threat and the person that's making it, but you then contact the appropriate authorities, limited to the degree that you have to say and to those that need to know. But that's your responsibility and your duty, and it's a very hard thing to recognise that the person you've acted for, you've now withdrawn from, your responsibility for the case carries on beyond your role in it. 
And that's the duty of defense, uh, defense of just cause and excuse, all right? So your responsibility when you receive imminent threats of death and serious injury means that you can't walk away from your responsibility. <coughs> Subject to the questions of privilege, when a client doesn't accept the merits of disclosing that evidence, you must not continue to act and any evidence which reveals a serious risk to the welfare of a child or serious harm to a third party may have to be disclosed even if your client disinstructs you and has told you not to say anything. All right? So um, a number of examples here about, um, are in the paper about the circumstances in which you might have to act, and that explains why this slide appears, because it's not easy. Okay, so moving swiftly on, dinner party question number five in conference. You do believe me, don't you? I hate that question. I hate it when clients ask me in conference. I have lost briefs because I've refused to answer them. I feel a little bit by Judas. I'm asked once, I say that's not my role. I'm asked twice, three, four times. By the fifth time, either the client or me is walking for the door. Why is that not relevant? Well, um, Lucy Reed here, who does a fantastic blog that any of you that are interested in the way the war, the law, law works, works in action should be looking up on pink tape. She puts it really neatly, um, and effectively, it's, that's not our job. Remember I said, you don't want me to tell you I don't believe you. Why should I then also tell you I do believe you? Because neither are actually any thoughts than an illusionary softening of your confidence and your ego. You might feel better, but I'm lying, because I don't know. My belief in what you've done is irrelevant if I think you're guilty. It's not part of my functioning and thinking. My belief that you're innocent is not relevant. I will not tell you so, even if I might think you're telling me the truth. I can't have one rule for those whose cases appear to be odious and difficult to run and another who comes to me with shining angels' wings and a halo. Right? You've got to be independent and to maintain that independence. And why do I say that? Okay, the role of a barrister is to be your weapon in attack and your shield in defence. We are not your friend. We're not your social worker. We are your legal representative in court who has a job to do and will do it to the best of our ability. And as Lucy says here, don't look for a lawyer who believes you. Look for a lawyer who can make the judge believe you. That's what you should be thinking of, all right? So I won't say... I believe you. I won't say I believe your child's allegations. I won't say I believe they're saying a pack of lies. I will, however, commit to fighting your case on your instructions to the best of my ability and at a point where it absorbs me night and day outside of any level of concentration you believe someone is capable of professionally. That is my promise to you, but not to say I believe you. Why do I say that? It's because we can all fall into the traps of believing our clients and then evidence comes to light which shows that either we were right and we are wrong. And the one thing you do not do is to want to keep yourself awake at night thinking about how you might have run the case differently if you'd have taken a different view of the case. Real life examples. Okay. Ben Butler, Ellie. I acted for Ben Butler. I was a barrister that secured the return of his two children to him. I fought that case on his instructions, and I won. His children were returned to him, and Ellie, who I'd fought for him to care for, died at his hands. Can you believe what that feels like to be in the position of a barrister who secured that outcome? Okay, what about Chana Alalas? Chana came to me with a case that had accounts of injuries to her baby, of multiple rib fractures, significant brain injury, bleeding in the brain, bleeding in the eyes, which all of the experts, all of the experts said could only have been inflicted by not one, but sustained abuse over the entirety of the child's life. It was only her word that she hadn't done it that stood as the evidence against it. How would I feel if I'd have believed that she was guilty and I hadn't fought the case, and in the course 
of the unassailable prosecutorial approach, which had the united evidence from the expert, which had all the treating clinicians saying that she, she or he had done it, which had not a single shred of evidence that we could call upon to try to support her allegation there was nothing she had done to the child until we started to cross-examine and until we explored the significance of vitamin D deficiency, until we discovered the existence of rickets, which went to explain the multiple fractures, until the concept of rickets, not as a disease that was eradicated, but as a disease that has flourished in our modern society. How would I feel if I'd approached her case on the basis that I thought she was guilty and I didn't try hard enough, when we now know unequivocally that that child died of benign causes? That's why you don't let your beliefs inter interfere with your responsibility to the client. So the tough dinner party question isn't how do you represent someone you know to be guilty, but how do you protect someone that might be innocent? And the answer is you do it to your best of ability because you're not the judge, you're the advocate, you have a responsibility to do it. It's part of the ethics that guide you into this profession, it's part of your responsibility to do your job, and if you do not think you can do it, you walk out the door and you don't become a barrister. It's that hard. When you do do it and it goes right, there is nothing better in this world than being the person with a team behind you and beside you has made a difference to that person's life that they will never, ever forget. That's why we do it. So, dinner party analogy, all right? You've gone and got your coats, the cab's waiting, the dinner party's over, you've got the beginnings of a bit of a headache, a bit like you might have now. And this is the part of the um, seminar where really I like to tell you why I'm agreeing to give it and why I'm giving it on this subject. And it's because I want to emphasize that when you are told about lawyers that are fat cats or lawyers that have no principles, lawyers that don't have any ethics, I want you to fight back against that perception. When you are told the phrase, lawyers and ethics, oil and water, I don't want you to laugh against the barrister. I want you, if you can, to think about why that's not right and to argue against it. I want you to recognize that when you become a barrister, you do so because you want to make a difference and because you think you've got the skills to make a difference and because you're prepared to go through those hours and nights of wakefulness, of prepping, of looking for the minutiae and the medical records, of looking for the unread social media message that might make a difference to your client's case. And we do it and we concentrate on that work long after them, the clients left the conference room. And we think about your case long after it's finished. Cases sear themselves in your memory when you know you've come that close to either a defeat or a victory because there always is a face and a name behind the nature of the case we do. And when it goes right, it's awesome. When it goes wrong, as it does, you have to learn from your mistakes. Why has it happened? Is it something I've done? Is it something they've done? Could I have changed the outcome? Because the other thing about being a barrister is there's no end to the learning curve. You will never be a better barrister than the moment when you've done your best cross-examination, you've sat down, and then the next day you stand up and you, you ask a bummer question. Then you're no longer the best barrister in the world. Then you feel you're the worst barrister in the world because we are creatures of ego. We like the public acclaim. We like the performance. We like the success. But that means that when we fail, we criticize ourselves more heavily you can ever possibly imagine and more than you can possibly level any criticism against us. So, being a barrister is a privilege and it's a burden. When you come into our profession, you do so because you want to make a difference, as I've said, but you do so being willing to uphold the principle of ethics, integrity, independence. And you do so that when, such that when you finish your career, you come to the end, you can look back and think, I have done a good job. And you look back at icons such as Marshall Hall. If any of you want a rapid introduction as to why we need barristers of grit and determination, then you start with Marshall Hall, because he was the man who had character, panache, intelligence, determination, and a flashy temper, as well as a slightly flashy approach. And he turned the way in which we approach trials 
back through 180 degrees. And then you think back to the 80s, and you think of the likes of Michael Mansfield, who took on really unattractive cases at a point where everyone thought that there were heinous crimes being committed by the Birmingham Six and the Guildford Four. And you think about the loggerheads that there were within the miners' disputes. You think about the issues in history where, at the time, you think you know what's going on, and you don't understand the truth of it until um, later lights. You want to be the barrister that people look back on with pride, not those who took the easy route. So, dinner party guests. There's no cheese course. There's no aperitifs. Um, there are good reasons why, when you ask the question about how do you represent the guilty, how can you defend, um, how, why do you not believe me, and you have the material and the answers to deal with them. And the one thing you have to hold on to within our professional reputation is confidence in the trial system, which requires legal representation for equality of arms, which requires an unbiased jury, which requires the, um, the uh, uncoupling of politics from law, which means that when you go into court, you, you face the trial with equal arms. So, cabs up, job done, questions arising, who'd like to go first? <laughs>